morning. Morning, John. Morning. Okay, if you have your Bibles, open to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. Acts 20. Acts where? Uh, 20, I'm sorry. <laughs> Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. So we are in our an ultimate lesson for the series, uh, Baptist Distinctives. We're on the final S, if you recall the acronym that we use, the B-A-P-T-I-S-T-S, and then uh, final S being uh, separation. And so we're looking at separation in three aspects. Last week we looked at personal, this week we're looking at uh, ecclesiastical. Uh, and then next week we'll be looking at civil, or what, what it's just a fancy term, basically, uh, separation of church and state. Um, so this week we're looking at ecclesiastical. So what is ecclesiastical separation? And it's uh, separation on a corporate level, and it's a command to be obeyed. Okay, so separation on a corporate level. Acts chapter 20. <coughs> Uh, starting at verse 17, it says, And from Miletus he sent to Ephesus, this is Paul, sent to Ephesus, and he called the elders of the church. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, uh, You know, from the first day that I came into Asia, after what uh, manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind, and with tears and with temptations, which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, seeing that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. Uh, but none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And now behold, I know that ye all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, shall see my face no more. And then uh, more admonition here. It says, Wherefore I take to you, or I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. And he's going to give a warning here. It says, Okay, take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. Uh, to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Okay, for I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Then also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Verse 31, therefore watch, well, therefore watch, one, and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn every... Uh, every one night and day with tears. His command in verse 28 uh, at the beginning, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock uh, to feed the church of God. Now, I know this seems kind of silly. I'm, I'm not trying to insult anybody's intelligence, but he's telling them to take heed to themselves and to also to the flock, uh, and in particular to feed the church of God. And then he gives warning of the fact that there's going to be people that are grievous wolves that are going to enter in, now in, entering into their congregation, entering into the church, and then even from among them, now he's speaking to elders, to pastors, that they themselves are going to turn away, um, that they're going to speak perverse things and then they're going to seek to draw disciples away unto themselves rather than seek to do what God's command was for them, which was to, to make disciples unto Christ, not, not unto themselves. What, um, what's the implication there then? I know that seems kind of vague. Okay, maybe I'm not making myself clear. <laughs> All right. 
He tells them to take heed, to feed them, and then take heed, in other words, to, to yourselves as well, that you feed off the Word of God, and then also beware that you have, and the bitches are going to come in, and even of your own selves, that men are going to turn away uh, onto <coughs> bad teaching. Yes, sir. What I visualize is the someone, people bringing in a false gospel. That's what he warned about in uh, Corinth, 1 Corinthians, and he said it's not another, it's not the gospel at all. And we see that everywhere. We see that in people, men like Joel Osteen and there's these so-called faith healers that uh, they just bring in a prosperity <coughs> gospel and there's no, uh, sometimes there's not even a mention of, of salvation by, by the blood of Jesus Christ. But. That's true. That's a good point. Um, what, what should be done? Stick with the Word of God. Uh, what else? But you have to you have to reject them. You have to rebuke them. And what else? Okay, separate. <laughs> That's not, yeah. I, I know it's not, it's kind of uh, again. I'm not trying to be insulting anybody's intelligence. <clears throat> separate on a on a very basic level. That's the implication there. Yeah. You're separating. You're making a distinction between okay, hey, these guys are bad doctrine, bad teaching. Keep away from that. You know, you yourself don't fall into that. So take heed that you can keep in the Word of God, and then also. Take heed that you feed the people the word of God so that they themselves don't give ear to that or give party to that or make a way for that to be able to come in. The reason why is because there's going to be people that are actively seeking. Okay, the devil's going to be actively seeking to destroy God's work. And then you got people just of their own pride and their own flesh operating. You, what I was getting at is you have to define what you're separating from. There's, there's a lot of times in fundamental circles that we separate needlessly from brethren that have small differences in doctrine, but we need to recognize what are the important things that we, what level can we fellowship, say, with another church? You know, it's, are they, are they on the same page, are they teaching the same gospel, or, you know, maybe we disagree on uh, some minor things, but what, you know, we have to, we have to define what separation is, I think, and yes. where we separate. Yes. Okay, we'll, we'll hopefully Lord will be addressing that in this lesson with regard to that. Okay, so ecclesiastical separation, separation on a corporate level, all right? So it stems, and it, obviously it's commanded to be obeyed. Um, wow, I didn't do that. Okay. Corporate separation stems from personal separation. Uh, from last week, personally, we're called to be holy. Uh, Christ's command is that we are to be holy like He is holy. In other words, mm -hmm. because we have the name of Christ on us, uh, we're representing God Almighty uh, in order to be an accurate representation of who He is, what He's like. As far as His character, we are ourselves to be holy. Uh, okay, and then the intent is to maintain purity. We can't really be in right fellowship with God if our lives are Pure. Okay, now this is all addressing uh, personal, uh, but the corporate is founded on that. Okay, and then evil, uh, evil communications corrupt good manners. In other words, bad teaching, bad thinking affects your behavior. Bad teaching, bad thinking, uh, you'll see it, the fruit of it in bad behavior. And then what the parents do in moderation, the children will do in excess. Uh, not always the case because you do have kids. <laughs> learn from bad examples of parents that maybe weren't living right or doing right. Uh, but the, the point with, with me bringing that up was the fact that um, in First Corinthians we're told that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. So it's very easy for kids to follow in the example, especially when it's a bad example of those that they were, you know, under whose leadership they were under. Uh, and so the thing is, it's crucial for us to be able to go ahead uh, to set good example. Um, now, speaking on a corporate level, since that's most of this is primarily from uh, on a personal level, on a, on a corporate level, as a group of believers, uh, the, the purity of the church. Now, the purity referencing as far as the pureness of not just holy living, but also our teaching, our doctrine, because that's really what governs us. That's what really is going to control us. We're told that the church is the pillar and ground of the truth. Okay, we are tasked. Now, mind you, it's the Holy Spirit of God. He's preserved His Word. 
uh, and it's going to be from this generation forever. So everybody uh, from us forward is going to, well, not just from us forward, but from the giving of the word of God uh, to whenever he returns, uh, to the end of the age, basically, the word of God is going to be available to everybody. Uh, so it's not like they're not going to have access to the word of God or not, not going to have access to teaching. Uh, but we are tasked with maintaining that, propagating that. Uh, Christ, when he gave, you could say, his final command. I wouldn't say necessarily it's his final command, but hey, good morning. Um, when he was giving his final commands, uh, Mount Olivet, when he was with the 12, uh, in, in, at least in Matthew, Matthew's version, uh, you have go and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, and teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Um, the task has been entrusted to us um, with teaching all things whatsoever he has commanded. And, you know, that's going to include, you know, everything in his book. If we're not careful to have distinction or purity with regard to instruction, with regard to, um, not well, not just our living, our living effects as far as people's receptivity to, to that. It doesn't change the truth. It just affects people's receptivity, people's image of what God is like, who God is. Uh, but the, the the truth's not changed. But the fact is, if we don't, if we're not careful um, in being separated with regard to our our doctrine, then our teaching, uh, then the next generation is going to be hurting with regard to knowing, okay, what is right, what is wrong. Okay, uh, the devil is actively seeking, the, here's some of the reasons why, okay, the devil is actively seeking to ruin God's work, okay, our flesh is naturally antagonistic to God's plan, okay, and unless we strive to maintain a distinction, this world won't have a clear picture of God's power to change a life. Now, we have our conscience, God's created every man, uh, hi, good morning, <laughs> we are in Acts chapter 20, Acts chapter 20. I'm sorry for those coming in. We're in Acts chapter 20. We have within ourselves, uh, the Bible tells us that uh, we are, he's put eternity in our hearts. Okay, so God's created us with the knowledge of who he is. And we read in Romans 1 that even his eternal power and God has understood. Uh, so in other words, we might not be able to explain it, but we have internal deep knowledge with regard to the fact that hey God's three in one uh, and his his very nature uh, we realize that you know God's bigger than us he's created us uh, there's not a person alive regardless of whatever the title they want to claim as being atheist agnostic or whatever whatever other title they want to put uh, you know to themselves that can deny the reality that okay God's real you know that he's active uh, they just want to you want to do something in your life. And even the reality of the fact that their sin is against him and before him. Um, the reason why, obviously, people reject that, we're told in John as well as in Romans, is that they love darkness rather than light. Uh, it's because their deeds are evil. Uh, and they realize as well that, um, you know, their, thing, their, their, their crimes before God, that's what their sin is, that's what all sin is really, is worthy of death. And so not wanting to deal with that, they'd rather not retain God in their knowledge. They'd rather just go ahead and suppress whatever truth they have and then say, hey, you know what, forget it. I'd rather worship creation of my own hands rather than worship the true and living God. All right, so us not keeping or maintaining Bible teaching, Bible truth, Bible doctrine, uh, and transmitting that pure form from one generation to the next, is going to end up with basically a big mess. You'll have people living however they want. Uh, it's not like, obviously, the Holy Spirit of God can't work in people's hearts or God can't work in people's hearts. Anybody that has access to a Bible, gets in the Word of God, and seeks God in truth is going to be able to know Him. Uh, you know, if you seek me, uh, you'll find me. If you search with me, if you search for me with all your heart. Uh, go to Titus, Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3. Thank <laughs> you. 
<clears throat> I find what you said, sir, is so very true. What helps us to stay so pure, very pure, before the eyes of God, is that he does talk to us through the scriptures, and we read his word every morning, and we, we listen to him also, read his word every night. And then when we pray, we talk to him. And um, that kind of communion with him is what really helps us grow yes. in purity. So I totally agree with you on yes. that part. Yeah, definitely, definitely. That's that's the only way we have to be able to have a relationship. We wouldn't know otherwise. We can't, you know, obviously we can't see God with our eyes yet. Um, but that that's how he's revealed us as far as, that's how we would know truth from error, really, is because it's because his word. He says his word, his word is truth. Amen. Thank you. Uh, okay, so Titus 3, starting, well, we'll start at verse 8. Okay, so this is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. And then these things are good and profitable unto men. But avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law, for they're unprofitable and vain. Okay, a man that is an heretic, after the first and second admonition, reject, knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth, being condemned of himself. All right, so now we have teaching with regard to a specific individual. Uh, verse 10 about a man that is an heretic, after the first and admonition, reject. Now, I know this word's like loosely thrown around a lot of times, especially in fundamental circles. Uh, but the word means really literally just he's somebody that's like contentious, he's divisive. All right, so somebody that is divisive. Now, what's the context here? I know we just read it, and again, I'm not trying to insult anybody's intelligence, but what's the context of, an, uh, of a heretic? Someone who perverts the word of God? Yes. Um, here specifically, well, we didn't read the beginning portion. We'd have to start from verse 1 and actually even going back to chapter 2 some. But um, <coughs> where he starts off, where we started off, where he said this is a faithful saying, um, he's referencing back to the fact that Jesus Christ um, well. You know, verse four. But after that, the kindness and love of God, love of God, our Savior toward man appeared, not of work, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us by the washing of regeneration, and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which He said on us abundantly through uh, Jesus Christ our Savior. Okay, that being justified by His grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of uh, eternal life. So in other words, that Christ, Christ gave us eternal life. <laughs> Uh, and again, it's not by anything that we've done, but according to God's mercy. And so it's God's goodness demonstrated unto mankind that he's merciful uh, in offering us forgiveness of sin through Christ. Uh, we don't deserve that, uh, but he loves us and we have a great opportunity. Uh, and, you know, obviously believers, but then unbelievers to become believers, to be adopted into the family of God. And that uh, being justified by his grace, declared righteous, as if we've never sinned, just as if I've never sinned. And then uh, being made <coughs> heirs, okay, not just, okay, yeah, I get eternal life, but I'm an heir. Uh, in Galatians, we're told that we're joint heirs uh, with Christ. Uh, in other words, I'm, I'm a <laughs> that's weird to think, okay, this is Jesus Christ, you know, creator of the universe, uh, and I'm on equal status in the sense as if he is my brother. Uh, before God the Father Almighty. It's like, wow, that's, that's <laughs> what a privilege that is. And, you know, this is a faithful saying. In other words, this is, this is wow, this is, uh, this, is, this, is, this, is a, this is a true saying. So we have this privilege in Christ, and then, and then he says that we should affirm these things, not just referencing it back, but also that they that have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. Now, we work because we're born again, not to be born again. So in other words, our work should be a flow of love of our hearts to God in demonstration of the fact, okay, hey, look, you know, you, 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 what you've done for me. Um, and then also, it's because it's good and profitable unto all men. You know, it benefits men, 
which demonstrates God's character to people. And so they have, if you can say, like a object lesson of what God is like when we do good works unto men. And not, by the way, it says all men, not just the good ones. <laughs> okay? Which we know the Bible says that, you know, it's none righteous, no, not one. So in other words, it's like, you know, even evil men, even wicked men, the ones that, you know, hate us and want to kill us and stuff. Uh, the fact is, God's good. You know, he ran in upon the just and the unjust, so he wants to demonstrate that. And that's what, that's what he's called us in. Um, now, he contrasts that in verse 9 with but foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law uh, they're supposed to avoid. So now you have a category of people here that want to argue about things that he says here that there's no profit in them. Okay, they are unprofitable and vain. So what law would they be arguing about? Moses their, old, law. their old traditions, they want to argue about their old traditions. Yeah, Moses' law. So he's referencing Jude, uh, Jews, Judaizers. Okay, the unbelieving Jews, I should say. Uh, or even maybe the believing ones that are given over to, I'm sorry? Keeping the Sabbath. There's a lot of people that still today are, you know, trying to tell you that we're, we're still supposed to keep the Sabbath. And, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of that. Yeah. Genealogies at the time, there were probably a lot of people, a lot of Jews, who were claiming that they had uh, a direct link to, you know, Aaron as the high priest or something like that, putting themselves in in a position of authority based on their their genealogy, and he's telling them to avoid that as well. We're, we're new I, creatures in Christ. Yes. I also think basically is that they believe in the law, and the law has been abolished with the uh, sacrifice of Christ on the cross. He said that when he died, there was the partition at, you know, of the Holy of Holies was divided. Yeah. So there's that we don't have to keep the law. There's like 613 laws. And now with, with the sacrifice of our Messiah, we don't have to keep those laws anymore. And that this is what they argue about. Like, why would you heal on a Sabbath, you know, well, we do have a Sabbath now, but it's Sunday instead of Saturday. We keep the we keep the day holy, rather, unto the Lord on Sunday rather than Saturday. Yeah, the fact that we worship the Lord on Sunday is in itself separation from Judaism and law and the law. Yes. In the law, as well as we're told, that it's a schoolmaster mm -hmm. to bring us unto Christ. So its intent was never to save anybody. So anybody that would want. <clears throat> to be under a system like that, or even argue for that to be the case, uh, is really just a self-righteous person. It'd be somebody that would... <laughs> I can imagine doing... I, I can't imagine somebody doing this, but I mean, I, it's just like... It'd be somebody standing before Christ, or, you know, on that day. You know, look at me. <laughs> look at what I've done. You know, in other words, like a bragger. They, they wouldn't be able to... Uh, well, nobody really can, but I'm just saying the fact you, it's, it, it'd be foolish. And then he points out, and then he just he mentions, okay, a man that is an heretic, so he's divisive. So this individual is going to be arguing for these things. Okay, so that's what the heretic is. In this context in particular, the heretic would be that. But it would be the divisive individual arguing bad doctrine, bad teaching. He's going to be the guy that is coming in, and he's going to be arguing, well, the Bible never teaches once saved, always saved. The Bible teaches whatever, you know, you have to keep, you know, and whatever, whatever, whatever kind of bad teaching you want to throw in there, the fact is he's going to be the one that's going to be arguing. So after the first and second admonition, wow, okay, so you're supposed to approach this individual to see, okay, you want to win them. Uh, but after that, you reject. So there's separation on the basis of bad teaching bad doctrine, okay? Uh, we see that again in, go to 2 John, 2 John. Yes? Would you consider the, the teaching that one can lose their salvation heretical? Yeah, because that's, the fact is, the Bible is very clear on that, we're sealed until the day of redemption, that he that comes to Christ, he will in no wise cast out. So in other words, he's not going to He's not going to kick you out. He's not going to take away your salvation. He's not. 
Salvation is not based on the individual. Right. It's based on Christ's work. He does the saving. And then his work is eternal, it's perfect, it's done, it's settled. So once a person is rescued, which when Christ rescues them, he keeps them. And that's, that's his statement on that. He, that's his promise given to the individual. The focus on a person that, usually, okay, most teaching that deals with if you can lose your salvation has to do with behavior. Um, in other words, most people that argue that always point to the fact, well, how can a person, they try to reconcile, how can a person live in sin, how can an open, how can a person, and it seems like, okay, they don't, there's no conviction in their life, it seems like there's nothing going on with regard to the fact that God's judging them, uh, and that they're happy about it, uh, there's no remorse about their sin whatsoever, and so they say, well, that's not possible, uh, you know, he, uh, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And uh, they, you know, they will point out the scriptures with regard to uh, changed life. You know, he he's he puts his desires in our hearts, and such. Uh, the thing is, our salvation was never based on us to begin with. You know, we have a responsibility to believe, and so our part would be we believe, and that's not really at work. That's but aren't we commanded to repent? To, we yeah, repent. we repent from what we're trusting in. Repent to, from um, disobedience and a, a life of rebellion to God. We're repenting for certain behaviors that show direct offense to our Creator. So lack of that would be refusal to repent, and we're commanded to do that. That's where I'm confused a little bit. Okay. Because if a person, for example, is living a very wild lifestyle mm -hmm. and out of fear of going to hell, they say they accept Jesus Christ as their Savior and they go right back into that debaucherous lifestyle, which could even lead them to their death. That's what I'm asking. I'm not saying a person can lose their salvation just because they trusted in their own righteousness, but... Don't we have a responsibility to be obedient and repent and turn away from a lifestyle that is in direct opposition to God? Yeah, that's that's called sanctification. That's uh, I, I'm not trying to be insulting. I'm just no, saying that's that's, that's what that's that's insulting. what that's known as. That's that's sanctification. That 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 follows salvation. That follows repentance, or it follows what salvation? Yeah, okay. <laughs> yes. When a person comes to Christ. They're turning from, <laughs> I can't do anything to save myself. Right. Okay? By the way, that includes even changing my behavior. So a person can change their behavior, but if they're not trusting Christ to rescue them, then they're reformed, but they're not born again. Does that make sense? Like, in other words, you can't, my, my works, my goodness, my self-righteousness, and we think of those as a negative, but there's a positive to it. The fact is, okay, if I quit drinking, I quit living wildly, I quit fornicating, I quit whatever, whatever you could list, whatever kind of sin. Uh, the fact is, if I, I quit my sin, okay, I've changed my behavior, okay, I've worked, fine. But that doesn't rescue me because God didn't call me to that. God called Why me to trust. Change your behavior? God, God called me. What's that? And I'm not trying to be argumentative, but oh, how, yeah. how would a person change their behavior just because they felt like it all of a sudden, or was it by the power of the Holy Spirit and their obedience to God? Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Like, it's, if, if a person just can stop doing those things, it's like they were never under the bondage of sin at all. But we people are under the bondage of sin, so it takes the Holy Spirit, it takes obedience as well, because... We're transformed, but we have a position, we have a responsibility to take in that as well. Like if my best friend is a wild person, I have to make a decision. This is not good for my spiritual relationship. And we, we're, but we have a part to play in sanctification. I'm sorry, sir. Uh, the Bible said we're a new creature. Right. When, we, when we reach Christ, we're a new creature. All things are passed away. We won't find joy doing what we used to do anymore. The Bible said by our fruits, we will be known. So if 
we are Christian, we don't become holy overnight. You know, we're saved. We're not gonna find fun going to clubs and doing all those things that we used to do. But we're a human being, we're gonna sin again. But as soon as we sin, we'll be guilty of it. We would want to ask for forgiveness. We would be ashamed of ourselves for what we just did because the Holy Ghost is in us. If we find joy doing what we were doing before we became a Christian, we, we need to check our salvation. So we probably weren't probably safe to begin. Safe at all. Yeah. If we find fun and joy doing it, maybe we weren't safe to begin. We, we, the Holy Spirit would find joy so going and doing certain things. If what? So our actions and desires would Yep, absolutely. Our, By our fruits, so I would say. We know, you know, if we walk in the street or whatever we do, someone would be able to tell we're a Christian, we're a good preacher. If we act mm -hmm. just like them and find fun doing what they're doing and don't think we need to ask for forgiveness, maybe we weren't safe to begin with. That, that doesn't mean you have a lack of choice. I mean, the, even a believer still has a lack of choice, and that's why we're talking when the Bible talks about repentance in some instances, it's talking about repentance of sanctification of you're a believer, you're saved, you're redeemed, and you've sinned, well then you need to ask for repentance from that sin and turn turn back to Christ, renew the relationship with Christ. So repent of your sin, repent of the wrong that you've done. So there's there's a repentance of salvation, which is turning away from your unbelief. You're repenting of your unbelief. And there's the repentance of sanctification, which is the, I'm a believer, I'm saved, I'm redeemed, but I've wrong, done something wrong against God, and you repent of that sin that you had, and you're turning from that sin. So, um, when you're looking through the Bible, and you're looking at where it uses the word repentance, it uses it, in some places, it's talking about the repentance of salvation, where, you know, you're you're turning from your unbelief. Right. In other places, it's talking about the repentance of sin that Revelation, a believer has Revelation to Revelation 3.19 is an example of that. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, he's That's addressing the powers of the Holy Spirit that bring us up. Not the individual himself. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That shows that they were saved and they have the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So the lack of repentance would be a sign of grace. Potentially no Holy Spirit. Is that a good production? I don't know. Yeah, sorry. He could be a hardened believer as well. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay. When, when you're saved, you're, you're taught in the Bible, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Yes. So the Bible teaches you how to live now. You don't know any better. And then the, as you read the Bible, and Jesus said, Father, sanctify them by thy truth. Thy word is truth. So we might not even realize what we're doing is wrong. But as we read the Bible, we're convicted, you know, that, oh, gosh, I have to stop that because it says so here. Yeah, that's that's really where it's crucial for us to be in the word of God because that's, that's, that's where our light is at. We can't rely. Our own senses really aren't that reliable, to be honest with you. Our own thinking. That's why we're, we're commanded to lean on his understanding on our own. Uh, and then, you know, he, he, he'll, he'll direct our paths. You know, the Ten Commandments also tell us what is right and what is wrong. Right there. Mm -hmm. so as a moral, yeah. Huh? As a moral law, yeah. As a, you know, as, the it's a the commandment, tell, yeah. You know, not to, you know, to to honor um, God above everybody, above everything else, and, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And down the line, you know, honor your parents. So your days and the earth will be long. So when you deviate from that, you've sinned. And if there's no conviction of repentance, what's going to happen is that sin is pleasing for a while, so you're going to be feeling pleasure for a while because you're in that particular sin, but eventually that sin is going to catch up with you, especially if you've already believed at one time, but you haven't repented of this actual physical sin, not the sin of belief like this gentleman said here. What's going to happen is that when you're laying on your back, God is still looking at you. Yeah. And he's going to get you no matter what. 
eventually something's going to happen where even if you don't feel repentance now, you're going to eventually feel repentance at one time. And you're going to be very sorry that you're feeling repentance at a time when you could have done it earlier before something bad happens. There's a lot of regret in people yeah, that have... Especially if you believe in him. Uh, second John. All right, Second John. We oh, start at verse six. Verse eleven is what we're looking at. Well, verse ten and eleven is what we're going to be looking at. Okay. Uh, and this is love that we walk after His commandments. This is the uh, this is the commandment that as ye have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. Uh, for many deceivers I entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. Okay, this is a deceiver and an antichrist. So you got people teaching that Christ never came in the flesh. Um, Where are you? I'm sorry, Second John. Second John. What verse? Uh, started at verse 6, oh, and we're now at verse 7. I'm sorry. Second John, verse 7. Okay, for many deceivers I entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. Okay, so God never really physically came down, but rather it was just a spirit. And then, uh, look to yourselves that you lose not these things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. Okay, whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. Okay, he that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. And verse 10, okay, if they're come any unto you and bring not this doctrine. Now, what doctrine is that? Christ come in the flesh. Yeah, Christ come in the flesh. And then uh, what he's referencing there as far as having had the doctrine of doctrine of Christ. Um, receive him not into your house, and neither bid him Godspeed. Okay, for him that biddeth him uh, Godspeed is particular of his evil deeds. Okay, so now we see, again, this is all referencing the same thing as we would have seen in Acts kind of 20. And in Titus 3, it's separation over teaching. Okay, so you got bad teaching, bad doctrine. Um, there, we see as well separation from behavior. We see that primarily in 1 Corinthians 6, the individual that was caught in adultery. Uh, he was with his, he took his father's wife, and then he, uh, Paul rebukes the church there as well that, okay, you guys are puffed up and not mourned over the fact that this individual is still here. You know what's going on. Turn him over to the uh, destruction of the flesh. Um, turn, turn him over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. And then he speaks about that little leaven, leaven at the whole lump. But here again, so this is bad doctrine. So we separate on the basis of bad doctrine. Uh, as well, 1 Corinthians, bad behavior. Bad behavior. And what that would be is okay, you got fornication, you got things that are just like, wait a minute, um, this is not right. Now, how do you <laughs> really in reality sin you want purity is we all or have flesh we're all going to struggle with some aspect of sin in our life we have the Holy Spirit of God living in us and we have ability to have victory daily okay so it is possible for us to be able to go ahead and have daily victory and to live a life that is pleasing and honoring to Christ uh, and that's obviously a choice that we make whether we willfully are going to submit ourselves to the leading of the Holy Spirit and submit ourselves to the teaching of the Word of God uh, or whether or not you know we're going to say oh, no, forget it I'm just going to do whatever I want uh, or even then just kind of like hey you know uh, it's not that big a deal this time uh, whatever kind of excuse but the fact is uh, if we're not living right then we become susceptible to being affected by bad teaching and then also affecting others negatively uh, we are commanded to be salt and light. Uh, we are a pillar and ground of the truth. Now, mind you, we are to reach <coughs> lost people. Uh, that was our command. But we're also commanded to influence believers, to stir one another, provoke one another into love and to good works. Just provoke, like literally, like stir, stir, stir somebody up. And so the fact is, um, I can't effectively do that if I'm not living right. And then corporately, if we as a group together, which our group is basically just us believers, a bunch of individuals gathered here saying, committed, hey, look, we're going to walk under Christ's command, under the Holy Spirit's guidance and leadership, uh, under the direction of the under-shepherd that God has put over us as, as he's being led. 
So again, no church. No church is perfect. We're not always going to be perfect, but we can be pleasing to Christ and we can be led by His Spirit and we can have a life of victory continually, constantly, daily. Uh, and if we are not yielding ourselves, if we're not seeking, if we're not in the Word of God, uh, if we're not submitting ourselves to being obedient, then we're, we're basically end up like a train wreck, or at least distorting the image that God wants to use us to present about Himself to the world. Okay, uh, believers should know about God's holiness. Yeah, because we're in the Word of God. But you got some that maybe aren't that apt to be in the Word of God, or maybe they're not that knowledgeable, or, or whatever the case may be. The fact is, the influence of your changed life, of our purity, affects them, motivates them, will challenge them to say, hey, wow, you know, that's different. I need God in my life. Uh, same thing as far as with an unbeliever, somebody that might be a scorner, a mocker, a scoffer, uh, or even maybe somebody that's not been exposed much really to religion. Uh, uh, any organized religion, uh, whatever of any kind, maybe they're from out west somewhere and then they don't have uh, an environment where, you know, there's really much of any kind of religion around and whatnot. And so, uh, what knowledge of God they would have, well, okay, you got your conscience, as we're told, you got creation, until they get exposure to the Word of God or to believers who are walking in the Spirit, then, you know, you're not going to really have that intimacy of, well, okay, what is what's God like? And then, you know, boom, you got now the challenge from the Word of God, and then you also have the believer's life to use. Now, mind you, God can still work through, uh, I mean, obviously he's going to work through his work, but he can still work through somebody that might not be, uh, quote, unquote, have it all together. Um, but it's, <laughs> you put obstacles and stumbling blocks in people's paths with regard to what God is like well, when, when we are living right, when we are doing right. Okay, so uh, corporate separation or ecclesiastical separation. It's just personal separation on a corporate level. In other words, as a group level, that's what it is. And our separation should be primarily based on doctrine, on teaching, on what is right, what God teaches what is right. And then as well, uh, if we go to 1 Corinthians 6, it would be on, on bad behavior as well. Like, in other words, you can't, and that's founded basically on what God's teaching. So primarily it's going to be on God's teaching. Okay, so that, that's how we really determine as far as what is right and what's wrong. We all have uh, some kind of moral compass that we're given because of our conscience created by God, but that's only really guided or sharpened or firmed or calibrated uh, by His Word. So if we're not in His Word, then you know, we, could, we, might, we, we might have an idea, okay, what is right or wrong, but um, I mean, you could throw 100 people in a room and to give responses as, okay, what's right and wrong? And you'll have, you know, probably like 200 opinions of what is right and wrong. So how do you determine that? You need a standard. You need some kind of metric, and that's that's going to be the word God. Okay. Uh, does, anybody, does anybody have any questions? Okay. Uh, so... Next week, we'll be finally finishing up, and we'll be looking at uh, civil separation, and that's separation of church and state. Okay, so how does that apply to governing authorities? And it's going to seem a little bit like a history lesson on the First Amendment and uh, <laughs> U.S. history, because uh, you've seen that a lot here. But it's it's actually time to work God pretty clearly. Any other questions? <clears throat> All right, we're dismissed.